I'm Asa Waldstein and I'll be your host and moderator. Now, we all want to avoid a Prop 65 lawsuit. They're difficult to defend, they're expensive, and they require resources. A lot of times in lawsuits, we don't think about how many resources it actually takes to defend a lawsuit. It'll, it can take your bandwidth away from growing your business. So we all want to avoid a Prop 65 lawsuit. Now, if you're selling a hemp product on January 3rd, which has any THC in California, this will require a Prop 65 reproductive harm warning. And as of right now, there's no safe harbor amount or allowable amount for THC. So before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. This is a town hall format. Let's have some fun today, everybody. So please do submit your questions in the Q&A tab at the top or bottom of your screen. Looks like we've got uh, quite a few coming in already. Thank you so much. This event is being recorded and I'll make sure everybody does have a download link. We have some great panelists joining us today who I'll introduce in a few minutes and I'll drop their detailed bios into the chat box on your screen as well. So before we get started, I really quickly wanted to share a little bit about me in this education series. I founded the Boulder Hemp CBD Group to bring together community and best practice development and support. It's been so much fun. <laughs> oh my God, this has turned into this really, really amazing, wonderful event. And it has since grown into an ongoing education series for the dietary supplement and hemp industries. In this group, we demystify complicated issues by putting them through a legal, regulatory, and practical lens. Now, I've always been a dietary supplement manufacturer. Sorry about that, the screen's going a little weird. Thank you. All right, perfect, thanks for that. I've always been a dietary supplement manufacturer I started making dietary supplements in 2001. And that was really the Wild West days of dietary supplements. And there's a lot of similarities between what was going on back then in dietary supplements and what's going on now in this crazy hemp world. Over the years, I've seen the implementation of many laws, such as the Common Allergen Labeling Law and GMPs for dietary supplements, to name a few. I've also helped to oversee three FDA GMP inspections. They've showed up at my facility with their badges. I've said, let me see, let me see your badge. Let me get out my SOP for what to do when the FDA arrives. And guess what? I've received no 483s, which is pretty cool. Now, I do work for a pretty amazing company called Functional Remedies. I am their Senior Vice President of Operations. Functional Remedies is an NSF GMP certified holistic cannabinoid company with a new approach or a holistic approach to true full spectrum delivery. Now we have an, we have an expert member of APA staff joining us today and we also have many APA members joining us. So welcome, I see lots of APA members out there. For those of you who may not know, APA is the American Herbal Products Association, one of the top trade groups for the dietary supplement and cannabis industries. Now, OPA has been around nearly 40 years, and the Cannabis Committee that OPA put together is celebrating its 10th anniversary. That's wild. Can everyone out there think about what was going on in the cannabis world 10 years ago? This is crazy. It's really amazing. It shows the foresight of founding Cannabis Committee Chair, Alon Sudberg, of course, Michael McGuffin, OPA President, and OPA staff. And I'd like to thank them for putting together this committee when many people didn't even want to talk about this healing herb. And today I've got the great fortune of chairing this committee as we celebrate 10 years to helping shape and interpret cannabis regulations. Now, the last Boulder Hemp CBD Group meeting was on ethical product marketing in the coronavirus era. Now this and other regulatory events can be found on our YouTube channel. And I encourage everyone to tweet and share this and other regulatory events because the more we can share the message of compliance, the better and stronger our Colorado and national hemp community will be. I do have a hashtag. If you wanna use the hashtag Boulder Hemp CBD Group, this will allow us to interact with you. Okay, the fun's about to begin. <laughs> In a minute, we'll invite our great panelists, but first a quick legal disclosure. This is for educational and informative purposes only, and no legal or regulatory advice is implied. 
and there's no attorney-client privilege. If you do need a tailored guidance, please do consult an attorney. And with that, it's my great honor to welcome our panelists, Dave Rodman, Managing Partner and Founder of the Rodman Law Group, and Jane Wilson, Director of Program Development at APA. Welcome, real welcome, appreciate you joining us today. Thanks, Asa. Right. We're really excited. Thank you, for, thank, thank you for having us, Asa. Yes, yes, we're, having, we're gonna have a lot of fun and more and more people are piling in. I think this will be a world record attendee webinar. <laughs> joining us. This is a town hall. Please do submit your questions through the top and bottom of the screen. So we've got a lot to cover today. I think we'll start with a quick introduction. How about we'll start with you, Jane. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, please? Sure. Um, well, you already gave a great introduction for, for APA, so I don't have to re uh, repeat that. Um, but as a trade association in the herbal products industry, a lot of the activities that we undertake are around education, advocacy on behalf of the industry, and communication activities um, for our members. And uh, as, as Asa said, we've had a cannabis committee for 10 years, and we've worked on a, a variety of issues um, over those 10 years, uh, most of them around regulatory and, and legislative issues, including Prop 65 and, and how it impacts um, both the hemp and the cannabis industry. And uh, as a trade association, we get to interface with a lot of federal and, and state uh, regulatory agencies, including OEHA, who's the, the group out in California that, that oversees Prop 65. And my personal background is in uh, the health sciences and, and public health. So that's the perspective that I'm coming from. Great. Thanks so much. How about you, Dave? Hey everybody, my name is Dave Rodman. I'm the founder and managing partner of the Rodman Law Group. Uh, we are a full service law firm that focuses uh, heavily in the cannabis and hemp industries and have done so since 2014. Um, this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. Ace and I have talked about this a couple times already, um, but uh, I think Prop 65 is one of the uh, great hidden uh, shoals of uh, the, the cannabis industry, the cannabis and hemp industry, um, and it's only going to become more and more important. important. Um, and uh, I'm glad that we have a chance to talk about it today. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Yeah, I'm pumped. We're going to have a lot of fun today. And thank you for the questions. I'm just going to pour in. We'll do our best to get to them. So I think we'll, we'll start with the high level question. Maybe, Dave, you could kick it off. How does this hemp how does this THC regulation affect hemp CBD companies? Well, I would, I would back it up a little bit and say that it, it's, it's not a THC regulation. It's a, it's a regulation that affects uh, pretty much everything in California um, and requires disclosure if anybody knowingly uh, causes uh, exposure to a product or chemical or what have you that uh, is either a known carcinogen or causes reproductive harm. Um, and so you hear about this all the time about people saying that everything in California causes cancer, reproductive harm, uh, but THC itself was actually added to the OHIA, OHIA list uh, in just on December 12th of 2019 is when the vote took place. Um, so that means that anything that has THC in it um, needs to have the disclosure for um, the reproductive harm. Uh, they also, I should add, uh, stated that marijuana smoke itself is a carcinogen. So if it's, you know, we're talking about CBD today, but uh, marijuana smoke requires a, a carcinogen uh, disclaimer as well. So to bring it all around to the question, uh, it affects hemp products because there's no safe harbor amount of THC in a product that you can kind of skate under and not have a disclosure in California. Um, for example, there's a, there's a lead uh, amount for, for how much lead you can have in a product. And if you have less than a, set, a specific amount, which I think is 0 0.05 micrograms a day for lead, uh, you don't, even if it has that small amount in there, you don't have to put that disclo disclosure on your product. Uh, with THC, there is no safe harbor. So if it has, 0.00001% THC in it, boom, you've, you've, you've triggered the rules and you have to put that disclosure on your product. 
Um, so a full spectrum or broad spectrum product is going to have some THC in it up to, you know, whatever, you know, we can get into whether or not that 0.03% limit actually applies to manufactured product. Let's go with that for a second and say that it's 0.03% THC. Uh, that doesn't mean that, that that means there is a potential for THC in there. And, and then if you move on to something like isolate, you have to be really, really sure that your testing is perfectly accurate and it really does only contain CBD isolate. Uh, so kind of as an unintended consequence, most CBD products are at risk for uh, a positive test and therefore obligation to enforce um, uh, Prop 65. Uh, it's a really long answer. Did I, did I answer your question, Asa? It was wonderful. It was great. Now, I wanted to follow up. This is for either, either one of you. Just jump right in whenever you like. To clarify, this does affect only Delta 9 THC and will not affect any other forms of THC, such as THCV. Is, it, is my understanding correct on that? Yes. yes, Delta 9 is the specific chemical that was listed by OEHA. I will add there's been talks of adding CBD itself. Uh, very preliminary. There's been no vote. Uh, it hasn't even been brought up yet officially, but uh, I see that as something as a very real risk on the horizon. If that does get brought up, Dave or Jane, is there a public comment period? I mean, was there a public comment period for listing THC? There, there was. The, the OEHA will uh, announce public comment periods on their website uh, when they are looking at specific chemicals for the reproductive uh, toxins and, and uh, carcinogens. There are different expert committees within OEHA that will review that information. But there are public calls for information uh, regarding those particular listings. And then they will put out uh, you know, what their findings are and uh, the final results. So there is some opportunity for public comment. I, and I believe the meetings themselves are probably public in nature if you can attend them. Well, I, be, I believe there's probably some type of email list or notification, is that through kind of the state AG or how would we find out if there's a, a public hearing for that? Do you, do you know? Uh, I know I'm on a list with, with OEHA. So I think if you go onto the OEHA website, there's a way you can sign up to get notified of public meetings and whatnot. Perfect, and I'll do my best to find that out and drop that into the follow-up email that I'm going to be sending to everybody. Speaking of OEHA and THC, <laughs> do you expect OEHA to come up with the safe harbor limit for THC or, or, or what? I mean, it's, it's hard to know. I know they, as a matter of practice, they hope to or they, it's my impression that they like to come up with a safe harbor limit between this one year grace period of listing the chemical and then having it actually be, you have to follow the regulations. Is OEHA given any sense of coming up with a safe harbor limit for this? I, I have, it, we've, yeah, <laughs> go ahead, Dave. I was gonna say, I, I haven't heard uh, anything dispositive on that. I, I will say there are over 900 chemicals uh, listed and uh, only 300 of them have safe harbor limits, so you can take that as you will. Wow, that's that's. Yeah, cool. and just to add to, add to that, they they currently have a list of first priority MADLs that includes 36 chemicals, uh, and I, I, they don't seem to issue many uh, safe harbors per year. So it, it it's a slow process. Yep. Great, thank you. And so yeah, town hall webinar. I think we're just going to jump right in. Lots of great questions from lots of wonderful people out there, all my regulatory friends <laughs> know and love. We have a question, but I'm not gonna give attribution to the uh, to whomever is asking the question because I wanna not inadvertently embarrass myself by mispronouncing their name or them. So we've got a question coming up from one of our friends in Boulder. What is the limit of detection for THC to not require a Prop 65 warning? And I think I'm gonna just start and say, any amount at all. It could be one part per million, although the higher amount, the more likelihood of um, plaintiff action. Would you guys agree with that? Um, yes. For the part, yes. Um, I think this is a, a good moment to just quickly jump in and explain the teeth of uh, Prop 65. Um, for people who are listening who may or may not have interfaced with a lawyer, 
um, on FDA matters. Um, I'm sure that lawyer probably has said a lot of the same things that I've said to people about uh, CBD products is that FDA considers them to be um, illegal, misbranded, adulterated, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but yet enforcement is relatively minor with warning letters. So there's been a couple of FTC suits. Um, so people take these things with, with certain degrees of a uh, grain of salt. Uh, I wanna stress that Prop 65 is a different animal. Uh, Prop 65 kind of takes uh, everything that is kind of known and bad about my profession, being a lawyer, and packages it into a one mean little ball and uh, allows for plaintiff's firms to sue companies on their own volition as a citizen themselves or individuals of their firm as citizens, uh, pursue these actions against company that, companies and settle for multi-million dollar amounts because every single um, infraction uh, is $2,500 per day after a 60 day warning period. Um, and so if you have tons of products, each one of those is a product, each one of those is an infraction, multiply that times how many days, you raise the amount, the amount of penalty to huge levels and the attorneys get their fees paid. So there's a massive, massive industry around this, just law firms suing companies. So, you know, it's not the same thing as well. FDA is not really making this a priority. Plaintiff's firms are incentivized and do make this a priority for themselves and it will bite you. So there's my doom and gloom. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, and just to add on to that too, the, the, the law doesn't specify a particular analytical method that is used to determine compliance. Um, so the private plaintiffs, as, as Dave was talking about, can, can really use any method that they, they wish to determine if your product, if they think your product is compliant or not, or that it has detectable THC. And I, I guarantee you to add on that, I guarantee you that the, the, um, the, the testing labs that firms will use will probably be at least 90% more uh, accurate than any than most run run of the mill testing labs. They have an incentive to be right and an incentive to detect the smallest amounts possible. Unfortunately, a lot of testing labs in this space are incentivized to kind of give the customer what they want, which is, you know, a clean bill of health, so to speak. Um, so they might not have the most, they don't have the same incentive level to provide accuracy the way a plaintiff's lab would, if that makes sense. Yeah, it sure, it sure does. So question coming in, will California be using the AOAC method? I think it, you just answered that. It's kind of, it goes to any lab that the plaintiff chooses to test at. And would that be under any method, not necessarily AOAC, would that be, would that be correct? Correct, there's no specification for a particular method to be used. Got it, another question that came in. We're having a lot of fun today, thank you. We have a lot of questions and thank you so much for submitting them. If you do wanna to continue to ask questions, please do do this through the Q&A tab at the top or bottom of your screen. I had one come in from a friend here in Colorado. Thanks a lot for this one. This is actually something I didn't know. Is it correct to assume, assume that Prop 65 will apply for animal products as well, or is just only humans? It's anything put into commerce. There might be a, a, a difference in how it's treated um, depending on exposure. Um, so you're generally not gonna yeah. eat dog food, but you would be exposed to it. So there might be a little bit of a tweak there, but uh, you know, there's, there's Prop 65 warnings for diesel fuel, for car garages, for um, uh, Disneyland. Yeah, Disneyland. That's, that's <laughs> pretty much Disneyland itself. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's pretty much, it, I think I could sum up my and almost every attorney's position on this quite neatly in saying if your product is going, is, if you make a product, I mean, let me, let me rephrase that. If you make a product, you should put a Prop 65 warning label on it because California is the fifth biggest economy in the world. Your products are gonna end up there whether you want them to or not. And uh, you don't wanna tempt the plaintiff's bar. Yep, that's a really good point. And I, I'm glad you brought up the exposure um, delivery me uh, mechanism or 
how, how we can get any exposure because you're right, if you were making potentially a salve for a dog that potentially had a little THC in it, you're putting that on your dog, then you're exposing yourself. And I think that's a great opportunity to say, yes, this regulation does apply to ingestible and topical products. Is that correct, everyone? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All right, perfect. Well, the questions are coming in. This is it, it, it would also it would also apply to things like a, a vape oil that that you would be inhaling. So any any route of exposure. Perfect, perfect. That's that's a good comment. Thank you so much. So there are so there are some different Prop sixty five warning formats. Can you walk us through a couple of these example? Maybe the the short form and maybe the online disclosure. Do you want to kick that off, Jane? Um, sure. So I, I think I would start with there's some kind of basic requirements for the typical consumer um, warning format. Uh, now you have to include at least one of the chemicals that is prompting the warning. Um, and you have to include, if you have one carcinogen, you would include that chemical. If you have two carcinogens, you only have to name one of those. You don't have to list necessarily every single chemical. Um, if you have a carcinogen, and a reproductive toxin, you would have to list both of those because they're different toxic endpoints. Uh, so you have to you have to list the chemical. Uh, you have to put a, a specific URL on um, in association with the warning. It's a, a California specific California Prop 65 warnings uh, website. And then there's a little uh, symbol, a little triangle uh, with an exclamation point in it that goes with the the warning. And that, that's kind of the basic safe harbor uh, warning format. Um, you can provide the warning in different ways. You can obviously put it right on your, your labeling, on your product label or, or labeling that is sold with the product. Uh, you can work with a retailer to have things like shelf tags or literature available that the consumer can um, access before they buy the product. Um, if you're selling over the website, uh, you can provide an internet an electronic warning to the customer before they purchase the product. So there's different ways, obviously, that you can provide the warning too. Um, there is a short form warning. So if you have a very small product with limited space available, there's a, a shortened warning. You can provide the, the symbol in the triangle, uh, the, the URL, and then either cancer or reproductive toxin, I think is the, is the wording. Um, so that's the kind of it in a nutshell. There's lots of obviously lots of nuances for different product types and, and things like that, but that's the, the kind of the basics for warnings. Yeah, I like that. And so thank you. Thank you for that. For that's, that's a full day seminar in four minutes from our, <laughs> our, op, our, op, our op expert. No, thank you for, for starting off with that high level. I know there's a lot of confusion I'm seeing. A lot of Q&A come in on that. Thank you. Keep, please do keep it coming. So if a customer puts their, a warning on their label, but they don't do an online disclosure, it's my understanding that's out of compliance. And they, if they sell online, wouldn't that be correct? Customer or manufacturer? I'm sorry? A customer or a manufacturer? Apologize, I misspoke, a manufacturer. So you have to have both if you're selling online. Would that would that be correct? If you're selling online, my understanding is they have the customer has to be able to see the warning before they purchase the product. Got it. And then when they actually receive the product, would that have to have the physical warning on it as well too? On the if, if they were yeah, if they were providing a compliant electronic warning during the purchase process. And Dave, you can weigh on this too, but I think as long as they received a compliant warning during the purchase process, it would not necessarily have to be on the product itself. Interesting. So I, I agree. Although, I, although I, think, I, think there's a, I think they may be considering changing that though. Yeah, there, there definitely is some, some talk of changing that. I, I also would say that um, that answer really depends on who, from my standpoint, who the quote unquote client is. So for all of you listening, what exactly your business is, because that answer is going to be a little different if you're a manufacturer, if you're a distributor, if you're a brick and mortar store. Mm -hmm. um, so, and the reason I point that out is let's just go with the easy one, your manufacturer. And let's say 
you somebody is buy, you know, buys a ton of uh, tinctures from you uh, to see, pick a product, and then turns around and sells it. If you're uh, and well, it's kind of a long hypothetical here, but if your uh, that that second sale could reintroduce uh, liability to your company if it doesn't have a label on the product because you did everything right on your website, fine. But then somebody else is selling it separately in you know, in large, you know, not like one-off things. Like people are say they're selling it in large amounts. You can reintroduce liability to yourself, and so there really isn't any incentive from my standpoint, not to put the warning on uh, your products. But you no, from a requirement standpoint, not yet. Yeah, that's great. This is certainly a hot, hot button issue. Now, another hypothetical here is if a, if a customer has, they sell to a distributor in California or something, and that distributor in their contract has said, yes, I will put the, the sign disclosure at the point of sale. Now, does that suffice, or does the product also have to have a Prop 65 warning? I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little unclear. And when, I'll just say one of the reasons why I put on these events is so I can ask whatever I want. So this is really fun. And I would like to say thanks for being patient with me. I'm host moderator, and I'm also doing all the Q and A. So if I stop. <laughs> thanks for being patient with me. I'm just having fun here in my own my house. My cat's locked in the room. Hopefully, she won't start meowing too. So my question is, is there a way around putting a Prop 65 warning on a product if a retailer in California has put in their contract that they will put the warning at the point of either purchase or the point of pulling it off the shelf? Uh, yeah, but that's not the positive thing. So first of all, contracting is, is essential. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, clear allocation of responsibility uh, can be a lifesaver in these situations. Um, but there's another component to that is that you have to actually communicate it to someone with decision-making authority and that isn't possible. There's rules about the registered agent and, and who you give the info to. But um, in theory, if you have the right, the right contract in place and you, um, you, you communicate to the right person, you can document all that, then you... You, you could allocate that risk to, to let's say that, that retailer if you're a manufacturer. But again, I come back to the, well, if your products get put into commerce uh, is somewhere else in California or resold you know, at a, on a commercial level, you're, you're just re exposing yourself uh, for no reason. Thank you. Yeah, to add to, add to that, even you, know, you may have all that contract in place, it may not stop a private planet from at least going after you that would you know you still may have some legal uh responsibility to defend yourself obviously uh, so you may be able to defend yourself successfully but you still have had to undergo some litigation because of that that's a that's a great point and i mean for for this kind of lawsuit just to get yourself dismissed under the burden of proof here you're probably looking at a twenty thousand dollar legal film fee minimum and that's just, that's, you know, you, everything else is in a row. You're blaming somebody else. It's their fault. You just have to show that to the court. That's still a $20,000, you know, price tag minimum. Yeah. Yeah. For people that have known me a long time, they know that I used to have more hair on my head. And actually I had more hair on my head before I had to defend a Prop 65 lawsuit. So <laughs> a whole bunch of reasons why we don't want that. Put the warning on if you can. Now, I like to learn best through practical examples. So I thought it'd be a good idea to continue to real, uh, review a couple of real world hypothetical scenarios. So here's one which I'm always really intrigued by. Let's say I am a manufacturer and I sell a, an out of compliance Prop 65 product to let's say a mom and pop shop in Idaho. And I don't have any contract that protects me and tells them not to sell in California. What if that store then puts up a little website, sells to somebody in California? Am I liable? And how can I possibly protect against this? You are liable and you can protect against it by putting the Prop 65 label on your product. That's how you do it. Everywhere, anywhere in, in the country. And, you know, from a practical standpoint, I know that a lot of people have a sort of fear of the Prop 65 label. It's like, I'm going to scare away customers. And, you know, honestly, that's just not true. 
Um, the, it's, it, these labels have gotten so pervasive that even the state of California yeah. recognizes that, that people just ignore them and that they have no impact. I mean, the, 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 the agency charged with enforcing this has said that in writing. So, uh, and, and that they're quite kind of flummoxed about what to do about it. Um, every client that I've ever talked to about this, they've, they've fought me every step of the way. And then when they finally do it, they see no drop in sales whatsoever. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's insurance that costs you nothing. Um, and I know that people don't want to do it. And they, 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 I'm not going to sell in California or I've got less than 10 people in my company, you know, all sorts of reasons. At the end of the day, just do it. It costs you a little bit, but it probably doesn't even cost you any more in packaging costs. It's just, you change up your design a little bit. Just do it. It's the simplest thing you'll ever do to save yourself a headache and a ton of money lost. Yeah. You know, I have to say that I did that after my prop 65 lear learning experience, and then I put it on everything that might ever end up in California. And out of thousands of bottles, I think I got three calls. Uh, so I was pretty surprised with that. Now, Dave, you bring up a good comment there about the under 10 employee exclusion. What are some examples of how, if you have under 10 employees, how that would or wouldn't, would not protect you from a Prop 65 lawsuit? So the, the, the exclusion to Prop 65 are government agencies, um, companies that, that, that don't sell, that aren't located and don't sell prop, uh, product in California, which we've already addressed as <laughs> kind of a fallacy, and then under 10 employees. So if you have a small company, you have, you know, you've got five employees and you're selling in California, you don't have to put the Prop 65 label on your product. Um, but if you have nine, if you have 10, if you have nine employees and then you hire two more, well, when does that start? Again, it's, it's one of those things where uh, save yourself the headache in the long run. We're having a lot of fun here. I love it. <laughs> so how about a product? Yeah, can I, can I, can I, before we move on, Asa, can I add on one thing too? Um, what, something we've seen people or companies do in the herbal products industry is also put some explanatory information on their website about why they're labeling so that somebody buying their products can go and get some context for why they're putting the label on their product. And a lot of customers or consumers are just looking for that little bit of explanation. But it's true, there's so many labels in, in California that consumers out there are not going to be surprised by seeing one. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Now, how about a product that was made in 2020 but sold after the grace period ends? Are they out of compliance? Absolutely. They, uh, the, 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 uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bounty incentive here, like I was saying earlier. So, uh, plaintiff's attorneys will hire people to go into stores, into like pharmacies, uh, grocery stores, et cetera, uh, the day after the grace period ends to try to find products that still have whatever it is in it, in it. So it's not even a matter of you stopping what you've sold. And, uh, it's a matter of you making sure that any of your products are not still on product shelves because that's not an excuse when the grace period ends. Thank you for that. Another comment that came in was, as a native Californian, let me validate this. People literally have become immune to the warnings. They see them every day and have for years, they're on everything. So thanks for, thanks for pointing that out as well too. But let me see if I can come up with some other questions. There's been so many, thank you very much. So as an e-commerce retailer, do I have to put this warning on our website overall? I think the answer would be if you're selling a product that is going to be in California that is out of the safe harbor or any compliant limit, you do. Would that be, would that be correct? Yeah, and you can get a little creative with that as far as if you're a good enough uh, coder. I mean, there are websites that, uh, you know, they will, that warning will pop up based on where you where the, the customer is so in theory if i bought yeah. it in colorado uh it wouldn't be displayed to me but if i was in california it would be displayed to me um then you also introduce some unless it's like you actually fill it out your, your zip code or something if it's like based on your your ip address that's risky because vpns are a thing um and so i wouldn't hang my hat on that but um 
yeah, it, it, if you're an online retailer, you absolutely uh, should, should be using this warning. Good comment. Thank you so much. And, um, and yeah, if you can just write it into your shopping cart, they top in a zip, type in a zip code from California, the warning pop up, shouldn't be too, too complicated in my experience. And a clarification um, that the, on a comment that Jane made in addition rather, that the uh, Jane is correct, the disclosure online has to occur before checkout. Yep, so we just addressed that. Thank you very much. And so I think we're having a lot of fun with these hypotheticals here. Um, there's, how many, how much time do we have? No, we're going through a lot of fun stuff here. So um, here's one, uh, excuse me if it's been answered already. Can a Prop 65 warning be a sticker only or does it have to be on the actual label? It can be a sticker, right? We can put a sticker on. Yeah. It doesn't fall off. Yeah, I mean, it would need to be a good sticker. Uh, yeah. We wouldn't want to design one that isn't gonna, that's gonna fall off easily. Uh, there's actually some case law on um, rubbing off and, and scuffing off of, uh, of warnings. So uh, good faith, good effort. I, I think that you're probably fine. And to plug OPA, I did just drop some OPA Prop 65 guidance resource into the chat tab, which everyone can see on their screen. And there's there are some great examples. Of, you know, OPA put a lot of thought into this, including warning examples, how big they have to be and that type of thing. You can't make up your own Prop 65 warning. It has to be a certain size and dimension and such. Now, how about this one? Can you label your product as not for sale in the state of California? And does this statement release your own company of liability Prop 65 warning? It's an interesting mm -hmm. question. It's a great question. I actually prepared for this question. Well, I should say I tried to prepare for this question. Uh, I could not for the life of me find the case citation on this, but I know that there is case law on this um, where a product, you know, a company made two versions of a product one for sale in California and one for not in sale in California, sale everywhere else. And that everywhere else sale said, the product said not for sale in California. It ended up in California through no fault of that manufacturer's own. They were subject to Prop 65. I wish I had the, the citation for you. I couldn't find it, mm. um, but I know that it's true. <laughs> Thank you. All I'm looking so for- So the, con the, the conclusion is that that does not protect you then? Or it does. Under, uh, no, uh, it does not protect you. Um, it does not protect you. I can't remember the specifics. If it was, uh, it, it basically it, it's like the idea that the manufacturer it was out of the manufacturer's control and it got sold anyway, and right. they ended up. I, I don't put it this way. I don't know if it would have gone on to win in court, but it was settled, which uh. you know. That means the company paid a bunch of money uh, to make it go away. So um, right. I think that's that's a pretty significant um, notch in favor of uh, not taking the not for sale in California route. Perfect. And uh, we have someone who asked about a quick way to explain the label. I'm just going to refer them back to that uh, guidance document PDF, which I just dropped into the chat box. If you need, if you'd like additional clarification after that, please reach out to me and I'll certainly try to help. Now, while I'm pulling up some more wonderful questions that they keep coming, I love it. Thank you. This means engaging <laughs> and fun topic here. Jane, I, as I mentioned, we're providing the guidance document for OPA with Prop 65. What other resources such as webinars should we be aware of that OPA can potentially help and educate us? Yeah, we do, did do a webinar on this, I think it was back in uh, February, so after THC went on the um, Prop 65 list, and we had, um, so OEH oh, oh, staff as well as a, an experienced Prop 65 attorney in California uh, that were the presenters on that, and there was a recording available for that, uh, so if anyone's interested, um, you can reach out to me or to ASA, and we'd be happy to help you um, get a hold of that. Uh, we also have a, a, a Q&A, just a, a very general Q&A, it's more of a consumer facing uh, resource on our website. And we encourage companies that 
uh, want to provide some information for their customers that they can link to that if they want or use that to develop, as I mentioned earlier, develop material for their own websites, just very basic uh, Q&A about what, what is Prop 65, how is it enforced, uh, what does it mean for a consumer product. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I'll drop the link in for, um, for not only that OPA guidance document, but OPA is a little bit out of the scope of what we're talking about today, but OPA did a great webinar called CGMP, CGMP Basics for Hemp oh. Companies, which in celebration of the 10-year Cannabis Committee um, anniversary, we, we made for, or OPA made for free. So I'll make sure everyone has that link. If you're a hemp CBD company, it goes over GMP Basics, but it's applicable I listened to it on my bike ride a couple of weeks ago, and even though I presented on it, I still learned so much. So it's one of those gifts that keeps on giving. I'll make sure I share that with everyone here. All right, so, um, all right, this is a good one. How about beta mercine? <laughs> beta mercine. Have we, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I know I said it was maybe gonna bring <laughs> up seeing it in the q &A. <laughs> beta mercine. I don't think we've seen any enforcement in this that I can find. Is have you seen any? No, but I mean it is definitely uh, on the on the Prop 65 list. There's no safe harbor, and if you've got a product that's anything but CBD isolate, uh, it's probably going to have beta mercine in it. So uh, I would say it's probably just a matter of time until we see enforcement. Yeah. yeah, and to build on that, anyone making these products, you need to know what's in your product. So you should know whether there's beta mercine in your product. You should know whether you have any uh, residual heavy metals, any pesticides, because then all of those things are on the Prop 65 list. So, you know, we're, we're focusing on THC today, but there's a lot of other things on the Prop 65 list that potentially can be trouble for your company. So, yeah, it's. It's pretty wild uh, that, that that's on the list, and that would be on the list for cancer. So if, we're, if we have a product with beta mercine, when we determine, because we should know, as you pointed out, thank you, that we have a product with beta mercine and some amount of THC, I would assume that the short form warning would have to include cancer and reproductive harm. Would that be correct? Yep. Yes. Stay in the audience here, but it's okay. <laughs> I had a question come in. Is there a Prop 65 warning application review board or reviewing entity that approves the intricacies of the Prop 65 warnings? I would just refer back to APA guidance on this or retain some legal counsel. I don't know if there's anything to add there. Uh, I'm not aware of any, anything that, nothing just, that OEHA offers per se that I know of, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty cookie cutter. Uh, it, it's gonna be, Pretty much the same thing for for all products that are that are meant for human use. Got it. Well, it's a lot of fun host paneling and being on video and bringing up all the the questions. <laughs> Maybe I'll have somebody help me with this once upon a time. But until that point, it's having we're having a lot of fun. This is this is rude. So <laughs> my cat hasn't jumped by me yet and really embarrassed me. So. <laughs> Someone asked, can we put the can we put the link of the warning on the package? Um, I think that goes directly into the Prop 65 short form warning. Would, would that be correct? Link link to the yeah, it says to the warning. Warning on the package. So I'm going to just assume that the um, the person here is referring to the Prop 65 warning. So I'd, I'd say that they're probably just referring to the P65 short form warning, if I had to, if I had to guess. Okay, let's yeah, or, or, or they're saying they're putting a URL to a warning that they have on their own website. Yeah, I don't know that that's, a, I don't know that that's an accepted, I don't know that that's an accepted method, uh, unless someone can access that before they buy the product. Yeah, if, if like know, Dave. this is a vape pen and I made it and instead of the Prop 65 stuff on here, it just said www.therodmanlawgroup.com and then on the Rodman Law Group, there was a, a warning. That wouldn't cut it. Is that what, is yeah. that what they're asking? I think so. And those That's are hard, hard to tell. And all right, I should have said this at the beginning, but I'm getting some questions about the naturally occurring defense. Got to add that into the disclaimer. 
Well, in the effort of in the benefit of time, <laughs> a couple hours to go over this uh, <laughs> recurring defense, which is very, very, very expensive and exceptionally unlikely to prove. If I'm not mistaken, I think one company has maybe one naturally occurring defense ever in Prop 65 history, and I think that was for mercury. If yeah, I'm not mistaken, at the mercury and uh, large, uh, large ocean-going fish. Yep. And so, what I'll what I'll do to that person, um, you know, we're connected on LinkedIn. Send me a message later, and I'll provide some extra resources, which I think, which I think can help you to read a lot about it, and including the APA Prop yeah, 65 webinar. Yeah, I was going to say we have a we have a section about that in in our guidance. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Perfect. Well, let's see. You know, Asa, I just I just scrolled through a couple of these these questions as we were here, and I just want to be really clear with people like we aren't saying this is fair we aren't saying this is right we aren't we aren't even you know we're not saying we're not we're not commenting on 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 prop 65 we're just telling you what the landscape is like so we have no control over what can be done here uh we or whether this is a fair law it's that's not you just got to accept this and deal with it that, that that's the end of, that's the end of the story i mean you have until california changes this law which it's not going to you got to play ball. That's the end of it. That's it. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, we, I can't say that we necessarily all would, would agree with it, but it is kind of state of the world. What the purpose of this talk today in this town hall webinar is let's educate everyone on the state of the world, the state of the regulation, so we can all protect ourselves. And, um, you know, we can't debate whether it's good or bad. You know, I, those are the debates that I have around my dinner table as my wife and daughter are rolling their eyes saying, come on, we don't want to talk about this stuff. You know, we want to talk about hiking and camping here. Uh, we got a great question which came in. Can the Prop 65 warning be accessed via QR code instead of on the label? Uh, if someone could see it before they bought it, maybe. Depen I mean, I mean, so I'm assuming in that case that the, the hypothetical is it'd be in a you know, brick and mortar store uh on a on product which okay maybe but they'd have to prove that it was seen beforehand and the store itself is going to have shelving level uh or should have shelving level warnings so um i think i think you're going out of your way whoever asked that question you're going out of your way to make this more complicated than it is i don't mean to sound like a broken record put it on your products make sure people see it you'll save yourself yeah. a ton of Kind of goes to that earlier question about putting a URL uh, to go back maybe to your own website. And, you know, I think unless you're flagging that as something that's related to Prop 65, so that otherwise somebody wouldn't really know that they should click on it to get the warning. Yeah, I appreciate the clever thinking, but I think the consensus is no, because Dave, I haven't even heard you say that. The um, optics and defensibility line, that's like the, the Rodman <laughs> and I've actually <laughs> absorb that into my own public speaking being, but I always give attribution to my friend, Dave Rodman of the Rodman Law Group says optics, <laughs> is something like that, your defensibility would be pretty hard to defend, especially yeah. on 65. Yeah. All right, so we got one that came in, which Prop 65 limit should be used to determine if a warning is needed for heavy metals, carcinogen, or repro, or both, and there's a list on the OEHA website, which um, lists all the chemicals and, and the warnings required. Right, so there's a list of chemicals and then there's a list of chemicals for which safe harbors have been determined. And the, the safe harbor list is much shorter than the list of chemicals. So for a lot of these chemicals, I think as Dave said earlier, there's, there's not a, a limit that you can uh, determine what, you know, whether your product is acceptable or not, um, just any, exposure from your product is going to trigger the warning. I think I'm just sending them a private message right now. Yeah. Multi the heavy the heavy metal the heavy metals do have safe harbor, so the, those are ones that you can determine. Uh, but THC does not have one. Yeah, definitely you can you can definitely work towards lead knowing what the lead limit is, for example, the safe harbor amount. Yeah. Uh, let's see if we've got a few other ones. Um, while I'm scrolling, is there anything that we haven't covered quite yet? 
Dave or Jane that you wanted to kind of jump in on? Sorry to put you on the spot there. Oh, I don't know if you wanted to cover, um, you know, whether companies should proactively try to determine a, an MADL for something like THC. Uh, I, yeah, I, I do remember us talking about that. And I think my comment yeah. was, unless you're Canopy Growth Corporation, uh, you probably don't have the resources to do that. And even that would be a stretch of Canopy. Um, and uh, the website specifically, just, it discourages, uh, discourages private companies from doing that. It is a incredibly time intensive and resource intensive endeavor. Yeah, it is really tough. And what and what's your amount? What is your amount going to be at the very end of that too? Um, you know, it, it could be it could be very low. If, and and why are you doing it? It comes back to why are you doing it? Like people, it really doesn't impact people. Studies have shown that it does not impact people to the degree that that individuals individual companies think it's going to. Um, right. And it's it's just good policy. Uh, if I sent the AG broken link out there, I'm sorry, I'm trying to cut and paste. If not, I'll send it to the, the group there. Uh, let's see, uh, how about this one? Are e-commerce resellers who sell into California have, the res have any responsibility? We need to insert to the package if the products do not have a Prop 65 warning. Uh, I think with that, it's, it's gotta be on the label or the outermost packaging. What about inserts? I've, I've never really thought about putting an insert into the, the bottle or the box. I don't know. Um, in addition to something, it, it wouldn't hurt. But again, these, these uh, warnings are intended to, to alert the consumer before uh, purchase. So if it's inside of a box in right. a brick and mortar store and you couldn't see it until it's opened, you're not opening that, at least you shouldn't be opening that in the store. So uh, it's got to be uh, a pre-purchase um, indication. Got it. Got it. Thank you so much. Um, got a question that came in. Does Prop 65 apply to cannabis products in California, medicinal, adult use, and hemp? So yes, it does. Absolutely. <laughs> now, this is a very interesting question. For we're going to kind of pause the CBD hemp conversation for a second. Uh, if it's, let's say, a marijuana product from Nevada that gets sold in California, that is certainly not settled law because in theory, that product cannot legally cross the state borders. Um, mm -hmm. All the Prop 65 lawyers that I know of uh, all still caution that, uh, that, that it would be at least a very expensive fight for that Nevada company not to have liability. Um, but it, it has certainly never been tried and it, and it is certainly the first time that anything like this has possibly come up because it's the first product that's been sold that's federally illegal uh, and, in, and at the state level isn't allowed to go across state lines. Um, I think that it would, pro if I had to bet, I would say you would probably prevail as that Nevada company um, if you were selling marijuana products in, in the Nevada regulated system not intended to go to California, but it would cost you a heck of a lot of money to enforce. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, the, I, it's a great question. Um, but back into California, yes, this applies to CBD, medicinal, retail, any kind of cannabis sativa L. And if we're talking about marijuana, then the smoke from marijuana itself is, is not a reproductive uh, a concern. It is a carcinogen, so you have to have both. Well, now, now marijuana smoke is on there as a reproductive toxicant, too. That was added oh. <laughs> in January, so it's on there for both. And, uh, and on the cannabis or the marijuana side, there have been, I don't know how many, but numerous 60-day uh, warning letters sent to, to businesses there for marijuana smoke and also for some pesticides that are on the 60 or on the Yeah, I mean, that's pesticides. a huge one. The, 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 the fact that it's uh, phyto um and, and, and sucks up, you know, heavy metals, people use bad, I mean, the cannabis industry didn't really know about Eagle 20 being a thing until 
they, all of a sudden it was a thing, but it's been a, a, an issue in the agricultural world for years. Um, yeah. And so if you have any chance of uh, myclenobutanol, I can never pronounce it, being in your product, you absolutely should have the uh, carcinogen um, warning on there anyway. Uh, it's yeah. just now that, now that the smoke itself is a carcinogen, you could theoretically just put marijuana smoke as the carcinogen warning because you do have to specify one of chemical one of x number of chemicals so it might i guess for for optics it might be better to list that than eagle 20 um but you got still got to put the, the the general warning on there perfect perfect and you know we we i think we could do this all day but i also want to be respectful i know jane's calling in from the east coast i did promise we'd be an hour or so I wanted to just have one closing. I wanted to first say thank you everyone for attendees. This is a world, it's a world record Boulderham CBD group meeting today. It's amazing. <laughs> a lot of attendees, a lot of great questions, a lot more than last time. Thank you so much. But in closing today, I wanted, I was wondering, maybe we'll start off with you, Jane. Can you tell us a little bit about um, a little bit more about your company and the best way to get a hold of you, please? Uh, well, the best way to get a hold of us, uh, we have a website at uh, www.apa.org, and uh, all of our staff is listed there. You can find my contact information. Uh, I'm happy to give you my email address is, is jwilson, J-W-I-L-S-O-N, at uh, apa.org. Um, but, our, and all, all of this, the resources that I mentioned earlier, the guidance document, the the webinar, um, our Q and A. I think he, uh, Ace has got links to those in the chat. Uh, but anything, uh, you can also just go right to our website and find them there. Perfect, perfect. Thank you, thank you so much. And then, Dave, I know you've got a you. The Robin Law Group has mm -hmm. a first amount of lawyers. You cover lots of different areas of the, the legal world. What are some specialties that you have in your law firm, and uh, what 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 are we uh, not talking about today that? PT potentially attendees could uh, use your help with? Um, I think we, well, so you can find me at www.therodmanlawgroup.com. You can email us at info at the Rodman Law Group. Um, our main practice areas, to answer your second part of your question, um, we're a full service transactional litigation firm. We don't do family law. We don't do high stakes criminal law. So your murders, your rapes, that sort of thing. We don't handle that. Uh, white collar crime, we don't do that either. But Anything else is what we love to play in. And my partner and I have probably represented about a third of the cannabis industry in Colorado over the course of our career, uh, our careers. Um, so anything in the cannabinoid space, whether that's marijuana, hemp, CBD, CBDV, THCV, whatever you want, uh, we, we can help you. Um, I gave testimony at FDA last year. We had input on the, the hemp council rules. Um, so I totally forgot the rest of your question. <laughs> so so it's, a lot of, it's a lot of great stuff. If you need help and you're in the cannabis space, talk to Rodman, Rodman Law Group. And, you know, I know that we've plugged up a lot, but it's a, it's an ORG. It's a trade organization. It's for the benefit of the industry. There's a lot of resources on the APA website, such as the webinars, how to open up your, your business in the COVID era. So I just want I just wanted to remind everyone, check out the Rodman Law Group and opa.org. And at this point, this does conclude our webinar. I really wanted to thank you, Dave, and you, Jane, for joining us today. Um, this has been a lot of fun. And my I also pleasure. Want to thank all the attendees. Oh my God, it's been so much fun for all the great questions. And at this point, this does conclude our webinar. And I'd like to connect, invite everyone to connect with us on LinkedIn. And I wish everyone a wonderful night. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Asa. Thank you, Jane. Thank you.